Hi again. I want to take a look at a new class of compounds today called the giant network covalent solids. And let's look at, first of all, how these differ from conventional covalent molecules or covalent solids. I have an example over here, first of all, of a, a small molecule, carbon dioxide. You might recall that carbon dioxide is doubly bonded to other oxygens by the covalent bond, which is circled here. However, when carbon dioxide forms dry ice, a solid, this weak intermolecular force is used to hold carbon dioxides to each other. And when we melt carbon dioxide, or through sublimation turn it back into a gas, we break this intermolecular force because it's weak, yet we leave the stronger covalent bond untouched. In giant network solids, we don't have intermolecular forces because we have but one large molecule with a repeating, bond, a repeating pattern of covalently bonded atoms. So here in silicon dioxide, every single bond here is a covalent bond. And if we tried to melt this material, we essentially would have to break that covalent bond. The formula too, silicon dioxide, merely reflects that there's a fact that there's a one to two ratio of silica to oxygen in this structure, whereas the one to two ratio in carbon dioxide indicates there's one single carbon atom attached to two oxygens. So we can understand the high melting nature of covalent solids because of the bonds we're breaking. In small molecules, we're breaking an intermolecular force. In these giant network covalent solids, we're trying to break covalent bonds, which are much stronger. Let's look at the nature of their conductivity. To do that, let's zoom in on one of these silica for a moment. Each silica is bonded to four other atoms, and in this case, four other oxygens, and they're arranged in a tetrahedral-like pattern. Each silica brings one bond, or one electron, to the bond. Each oxygen brings one electron to the bond. These electrons are held in that place. They can't move because they're used to maintain the covalent bond. Since the electrons are essentially locked in place, they're not free to move, which is one of our conditions for something to conduct. You must have freely moving charges, be they electrons or ions. So our electrons are locked in place, and as a result, we have a poor conductor. Silicon dioxide is the only example of a material that has this giant network solid behavior. Diamond is another material that shows this behavior. Diamond, however, consists of just one atom. Every atom in this, in this structure is carbon. Every carbon covalently bonded in a tetrahedral-like arrangement to four other carbons. And like silicon dioxide, the covalent bond being very strong makes them very high melting. And again, the electrons locked into these locations and unfree to move, that also makes these a very poor conductor. Carbon also has another arrangement. Carbon can form sheets, flat sheets of carbon atoms arranged in hexagons. This is the formation of what we call graphene. So every carbon here we can see is bonded to three others, unlike in diamond. So let's take a look at that carbon for a minute, bonded to three other carbons. This central carbon brings four electrons into play, so I'll show them. Three of them are used to bond with the other carbons, and it's got one electron that's unbonded. These other carbons also bring one electron into their bond and have the free electron as well. This free electron gives graphene or graphite the capability of conducting electricity. Because this electron isn't locked in the bond, it's free to move. We use the word delocalize to describe its behavior, meaning it's not stuck at one location. 
This gives graphene its conductivity. We can take several graphene sheets and stack them together, one on top of the other, and we create a material that's called graphite, which we find in pencil lead. Graphite molecules are attracted to each other by weak intermolecular forces. So between these sheets of graphene, we have the weak intermolecular force. This leads to an interesting behavior of, of graphite. It can be both hard and soft, meaning that if we apply a stress in this direction, we would be trying to break covalent bonds. So as a result, we get the material being very hard to break. However, if we apply a force in this direction, the bond we would be breaking is the weaker intermolecular forces. And in fact, it's very easy to slide that sheet out. In fact, every time you write with a pencil, that's what you're doing, is you're breaking intermolecular bonds and leaving sheets of graphene and graphite on your paper. While we're on this topic of network solids, I'd like to also take a look at something that are called allotropes for a moment. Different structures of the same element. Oxygen, for example, can form O2 or O3. These are considered allotropes because they're made of the same element oxygen. Diamond and graphite are also considered to be allotropes of the element carbon because that's the building block, carbon atoms. An interesting point about these carbon atoms is that diamond will essentially all end up as graphite in the future as that's a more stable form. Carbon also has a third arrangement. It can form spherical molecules called fullerenes. Fullerenes aren't a network solid. They're low melting. Let's look at why that is. So here we have one C60 and a second C60 and they would be held or attracted to each other by a weak intermolecular force. When we melt fullerenes, again remember, we're breaking this weak intermolecular force. We're not breaking the covalent bond. So as a result, these are low melting. If we take a look at the carbons that make up this material, again that carbon is bonded to three other carbons. So it also has that free electron a little bit different shape though. It's not a flat triangle as in, in the case of graphene. It's rather a pyramid with a free electron. That free electron can move around within the molecule, allowing it to be a good conductor within the molecule. However, that electron is not able to jump from one molecule to the next. As a result, it is a poor conductor between molecules. So that concludes our program on network solids and an introduction to allotropes. In our next program, we'll take a closer look at the nature of this bond that exists between our molecules. Thanks for watching.